The Enuma Elish is one of the oldest stories we have, if not the oldest. This wonderful story was found on clay tablets from the oldest civilization we currently know of, now called Sumerian. It has always been passed down in one way or another, and now it will be passed on to you. This magnificent story is about the creation of our solar system, although that meaning had been lost to us for quite some time. Especially when an ancient god placed his own name upon creation, Marduk. Sound familiar? I was first introduced to this story through the writings of Zachariah Sitchin, starting with a book called The Twelfth Planet. When one starts to read any translation of the Enuma Elish, one might regard all the strange names with confusion. Certainly, this is the reason why it's not clearly understood. There is a lot of double meaning in this ancient story. In one respect, it is a testimony of the god Marduk's supremacy. In the other, the gods mentioned in this story are actually planets, and the story is about a planetary collision. The Enuma Elish is the source of the myth of Nibiru, or Planet X. As Mr. Sitchin concluded, the easiest way to understand these names is to plug in the planet's names according to their order from the sun outward. A god's minister is therefore its moon. Words like destiny or tablets of destiny is referring to a planetary orbit and net refers to gravity. Personally, I felt his theory was an open invite to see for ourselves if what he said was true. After using Sitchin's method, the story became clearer. Unfortunately, my results are not exactly the same as Mr. Sitchin's. This is in no way an insult to his work. In fact, I credit him for opening the door wide open. So here it is, a retelling of the Enuma Elish, or rather, the creation of the solar system. Long ago, high above, when the heavens had not been named, there was the primordial forming sun called Apsu, and his moon, Mumu, now called Mercury, and Tiamat, she was the mother, a planet filled with life. All of them shared in the waters of chaos, or space dust, before the other planets had been called into being, long before they had orbits, long before their destinies were ordained. Then the planets, or gods as they were once called, were created in the midst of these waters in the heavens. Between them, Tiamat and Apsu, Two were created called Lahu and Lahamu, which we call Venus and Mars. Then eons passed. Beyond Tiamat, another pair were created. They were great planets, larger than the rest, called Anshar and Kishar, Jupiter and Saturn. And beyond them was created a beautiful god, which looked like a sapphire, Anu or Uranus. And from him, another was created in his likeness, called Ea, or Neptune. Seven great planets now lived in those waters of chaos in the heavens where the primordial sun ruled. Apsu was bothered by the commotion, so there was unrest. He called upon his minister, Mumu, and with Tiamat, whose name is like Eve's, to take counsel against the planets. It was Mumu who suggested killing them, for peace and rest, he said. But in the creation of the planet Ea, the seventh celestial body, the waters of creation had been so used greatly as if spells were cast, and so Apsu could grow no more, and it killed him. Then Apsu's countenance grew bright. This is when the sun ignited. And Mumu was kept in a tight orbit, like a noose around the neck. So is the fate of Mercury and the Sun forever and ever until the end of time. Oh, and Tiamat, mother of the gods, she was angry. She shook with anger, and her tears became an army. She chanted spells. The waters of creation were at her command. She gave birth to invincible monsters at which the other planets trembled at. They were named the Viper and the Dragon, the Hurricane, the Raging Hound, 
the scorpion man, the mighty tempest, the fish man, and the ram. And of these moons that were her sons, one was created with all her might, exalted above all the others, a great king was created. In fact, she called him king. And he was her champion, to march before the forces. He was her new spouse. This warrior had the outermost orbit. He would lead her demon army. King's orbit was so grand that it compared to those of the, of the gods, and they were jealous. How did this upstart moon get a destiny so wide such as theirs? Tiamat was in a fury. She would destroy the others in her vengeance. Those that King conquered fell into her net. So great was her pool of gravity that even Mars was taken to orbit her. The old god, Lahamu, had become the monster Lahamu. Surely her commands were mighty. None could resist them, even Gaga. Anshar's minister, Jupiter's outermost moon, was sent to give word to Lahamu and Lahamu of the coming of a savior to vanquish the evil Tiamat. But he was taken by her too. After this fashion, she had eleven bodies around her. As there was already disorder between these gods, there was now even more, and the other gods feared for themselves. One by one, they passed close to Tiamat's army and trembled at her might. Even Ea could not subdue her, this mighty dragon. She was like a maelstrom, causing havoc there between Lahmu and Anshar, Venus, and Jupiter. But in the midst of the heavens, beyond Ea and his consort moon, his wife called Damkina, they gave birth to one that would save them, one greater than the rest, and they called him Marduk. Marduk was born perfect, with a double godhead, binary, two planets as one. Twins, they say, are holy. He was heavier than the rest, mighty and bright, for in his crossing around the sun he is brighter than ten stars. Even Anu, Uranus, exalted him in passing, then passed him the crown, thus bowing to him. And so Uranus is on its side. Marduk's four great moons were gifts from Anu. They were the south wind, the north wind, the east wind, and the west wind. Along with those Amassed were seven more moons, gifts from the other gods. They were the evil wind, the tempest, the hurricane, the fourfold wind, the sevenfold wind, the whirlwind, and the wind which hath no equal. One by one, Marduk passed the great gods who feared Tiamat and her army of demons. As he passed Anshar, he kissed him before the assembly. That is to say, they touched ever so slightly, of which the mark is still on Jupiter to this day. Marduk came upon Tiamat in all his glory, and her inward parts were shaken. Then Marduk cast his net, that is, she fell into his gravity. As they came close, he held a sword of lightning before her and struck her. Tiamat's army fled in fear, and so they became comets. Then Marduk's weapons came upon her. The terrible wind struck her so hard that she cracked Tiamat was now crippled. Upon Marduk's second pass, he stood upon her body and cleaved her in two as one cleaves a flatfish. Her blood was spilled. Her shattered remains became a barrier that separates the inner planets from the outer, the asteroid belt. And as for the other half of Tiamat, she was thrown inward, beyond where the monster Lahamu, or Mars, came to rest. Her remains are what we call this planet, Earth. Pangaea was what was left, and the Mariana Trench is the scar. In time, her spin spread her land out almost evenly to the planet that we have today. Now Kishar, also called Enlil, held up Marduk's weapons, and he took the bow and raised it before the assembly of the gods. There they remain to this day, the rings of Saturn, forever and ever, until the end of time. And as for King, Tiamat's warrior, he was blamed for the whole thing and brought to judgment. Marduk's net took him like a man in fetters, 
or ankle chains, King was dragged upside down and placed before Ea, or Neptune. Lo and behold, Neptune's main moon is retrograde, the one that is, is as big as our moon. Triton is the name that we use, but he is king, whose fate is set next to Neptune forever and ever until the end of time. And as for our moon, Marduk had fixed a bolt upon this earth. He set a watchman. That is, it was one of his moons, one of the winds, that was dragged with the pool of the cleaved body of Tiamat, which now watches over us forever and ever until the end of time. The planets were given rightful orbits. Marduk, the savior, set their destinies. In turn, the gods set up his station, his place of crossing, between the sprinkled remains of the cleaved planet and the red one, between Mars and the asteroid belt. The word used was Upsu Kenaku. It comes across each shar, that is 3,600 years, and some call this planet Nibiru, but it is heaven. <laughs>